שלום, שבוע טוב. Our shiur is dedicated לעילוי נשמת רפאל משה בן אליהו, זיכרונו לברכה. And our hero for today is רב יצחק אלחנן ספקטור, who was called, in a, after his death, they called him אביה עגונות, the father of עגונות. עגונות means women, being, literally it means chained. Someone that is chained, but what it used to mean uh, as a woman that her husband has disappeared and either because of deliberately or, or, or involuntarily, but he disappeared and now she's stuck because she cannot remarry and she doesn't know where her husband is and if he's even alive. So they were called Agunot and we would speak about uh, the great efforts that he made in order to be able to to uh, undo their chaining, undo their aginut, and uh, allow them to, to remarry. Okay, now in order to understand the story of Yitzhak Rechanon Spectre, we have to rehearse a little the background of Eastern Europe, of the Russian kingdom, Tsarist Russia, and their relationship with the Jews. And the whole thing, calling, speaking about Russian Jews is almost a misnomer. When you speak about this period, why? Because in Russia proper, Jews were not allowed to live for centuries. Jews were not allowed to live in Russia till the fall of the Tsarist regime. regime. That, that's what it was. Now, so how can it be that millions of Jews, millions, and uh, three million and four million, even six million Jews at certain points lived under, uh, under the Tsarist, Tsarist regime? That's because Russia... That is not something new. Russia always set her eyes to expanding to the to everywhere, but especially to this uh, area of Ukraine, of Poland, Lithuania. And in the end of the 18th century, we are thinking about the 19th century. In the end of the 18th century, there was the partition of Poland, uh, and it was in several stages. It's um, beyond our scope, but. And basically what happened was that Russia got the major part of Poland. Poland. And with and Poland of then, it's not over Poland. It's the old kingdom of the kingdom of Poland. So we speak about Lithuania, speak about Ukraine, everything was under the same roof. And with it, they got a side prize that they were not and they knew it, it's there, but uh, it was uh, like it was it was booby trapped. So they had to swallow that. And that was, they got millions of Jews. And not only millions of Jews, the most Jewish Jews lived in Eastern Europe. So it's not that you get some uh, already liberal Jews of France, of Germany, nice people uh, dressed in uh, modern clothes. No, you have the most Hasidic the, the, the whole the whole deal. So the Russians were not very happy with it. And what they did was they act in two ways that really were contradicting. But they, A, they were not very, I mean, I'm not talking about the people. The people, the Russian people are as smart as any other people. But the way that the government was set was not very smart. So, and B, they were very anti-Semitic. So what happened was they were working in two ways that were contradicting. On one way, on the one hand, thank you. Uh, they were trying to uh, a culture and if possible to completely uh, uh, dissipate the Jews into the Russian uh, people and and uh, they should completely disappear and Russify etc on the other hand, So that means that you teach them uh, Russian, that you give them uh, liberal schools. On the other hand, they were so anti-Semitic. So they had all of these decrees against Jews. It was the Jews were not allowed to live in Russia, as I said. So they were only allowed to live in this area of Poland. And then, in former Poland. And then, even then, they, they discriminated against them And they were only allowed to live in certain places and walk in certain things. And there were special taxes against the Jews. And they were they had to dress in a certain funny way. Now, if you want to culture someone, you are not supposed 
to have him decrease against what is weighed. It doesn't make sense. But you know what? It doesn't make sense. And that's it. It's anti-Semitic. Anti-Semitism never made sense. And it's a it's a it's a mental disease. And it, they so they closed the printing houses. Why? Because printing houses were printing Jewish stuff. We don't want you to be Jewish. So they closed printing houses. Uh, the the most horrific thing they did, the Russians, was uh, what was called the Cantonistim. Now the Cantonistim that means that the the Russians said, you know, you Jews uh, should participate in the army as anyone else. So, but we don't want really Jews to be in the army. That's Shigaon. What we'll do with these type of people? So we need to take them as children. If you take them as children, they would become real soldiers. And every Jewish community had to give a certain amount or percentage of children, really children, 10 years old, 9 years old, uh, to, the, uh, to the army. You can only, and that was for a service of 25 years. You can only imagine the horror of parents uh, that were supposed to do so. It, it, it ran, it, it, it also it completely ruined Jewish communities because what happened was no parent would want to give a child. So everyone would pay whatever needed in order to bribe. So someone else, a certain amount of children would be given. So the, the Jewish community was going against itself because everyone was trying to cover himself and the neighbor child should be taken. And in the end, the children of the most poor or the orphans were taken. Many times they were kidnapped, kidnapped in the middle of night from the house. Of, it's, these are horror stories. Uh, if you have a very uh, strong stomach, you can read about it. There is a lot that was written, but it's, it's really, it's, it's all. And as you can imagine, after 25 years, most of them were uh, the, the ones that survived. Many died in the first years because you could take a nine years old child and you put him in the Russian army. Even nowadays, Russian army. Is not a Kaitana, but but back then it was a, a complete. It, it was what it was, and uh, and many children just died. It's a, again there are accounts. It's very very terrible. And mm -hmm. after twenty five years, those that survived, uh, how much did they know? They were allowed to leave after being released from the army twenty five years later. They allowed them to live in certain cities that were exclusive for Russians because they did serve in the army. So that was the one privilege they got. But uh, many of them never married. They were released at the age of 35. And it was very old for a Jew in that era to, to get married. And they, they, they were, I mean, it's sad to say that, but they were uh, unwanted as husbands because they knew nothing. They had no manners. They, they, you can imagine. So that was the world into which Rabbi Tzak El Hanan was born and in which he acted all of his life. He was born in 1817 and he passed away in 1896. So the revolution is still 20 years into the future. So that's the world he's, in, he's acting in. It's very important to understand this background, to understand uh, the figure of Rabbi Tzak El Hanan. So as I said, he was born in 1817 in a small uh, state named Ras, or Ash Ras, they, they call it, in a, in a place called Grudna. Nowadays, it's in Belarus. I'm not sure if Belarus is still considered as an independent state from Russia. I don't know. Things are changing very rapidly in this area of the world. Uh, but uh, but it's in a place, nowadays it's Belarus. There, it was all part of the great Russian empire. Uh, his father, the father of Rebitzak el Hanan, was the Rav, of the shtetl, and most of his learning was with his father. His mother passed when he was 10 years old. We spoke about it a few times. Unfortunately, it was very common back then. Uh, people, people, all of them died young. No one lived, I mean, not no one, but very few lived to what we would consider as just normal, average life expectancy. Uh, back then, it was 40-something. And, uh, and women were, most of the time, uh, died even younger because of childbirth, because of uh, of less uh, just less health treatment. Uh, so his mother died when he was ten, uh, in the age of thirteen, uh, which is the proper age, as you know, to get married. So he was married with his wife Sarah Razel, 
And this, these were, her parents were the rich family of the neighbored uh, city. Uh, and that's because he was already known as a genius, of course, because he was a genius. And uh, and as a matmid, someone sitting and learning all the, all the time. And he, that's what, we, what he would be for the rest of his life. I mean, that was the man of Torah learning. And when I say Torah, I mean Torah in the most... <laughs> I'm not saying it's a derogatory term, but in the most narrow sense, I mean, Torah is Gemara <laughs> and Alacha, not, not Rabbi Yudah Levi. It's not, it's not Machshava, it's not Ashkofa. It's not, all, but not that he had anything against it, just not who he was. He was a Alacha man par excellence. Gemara, uh, Skim, that's who he was. And uh, he was, he became known in the, in the area. So the rich family of the near city and wanted him as a, a satan for their daughter, a Sarah Razel, and he moved to them again, as was the common practice back then. He lived by his in-laws, and they supported him while he sat and continued to learn. The Rav that gave him the smicha was called Binyamin Diskin. Binyamin Diskin. So for the next seven years, from 13 to 20, he's sitting and learning again. It's no yeshiva that... There were formerly shivot as Volojin that we spoke about a few times, but many Gdolim back then were not growing up in the yeshiva system. They were just sitting and learning. So you would sit in, in a shul, you'd dream about such a library. Usually you had much, much, much less than what we have here. And, uh, and you just sit and learn and learn. There no smartphones, no TVs, no anything. Uh, only sitting and learning the whole day. Now, for most of the children, it was a disaster. That's why <laughs> there was a, a big uh, a problem with Jewish education. But for some children, the the type that are self that have self mishmat uh, atzmit, right? Uh, self discipline. Thank you for those with self discipline and the like to learning. That's that's just uh, heaven. You know, they used to say in the yeshivot that heaven and hell are the same thing. You just go up, and there is a the longest shiur you ever had in Gemara. So, so for some people it's heaven, and for some people it's hell. So that that was what education system was back then. Some would claim that to this day, and it's 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 one thing. And for some children that were the type, it was just what they needed. They don't need other children. They don't need to play. They don't need us. Put them with a Gemara, they would sit and learn. And for others, it was uh, completely disastrous, and they just came out and complete amounts and knew nothing. Uh, and but for him, the system worked. Uh, in the young age of before, just before his twentieth birthday, he became uh, the rav of a very very small place called Zevelin. Uh, <clears throat> so all of these places are more or less in the same area. Uh, so he becomes the he becomes the rab of the small place. Very when you speak about very few Jewish families. So really, the rab has nothing to do there. Uh, and you have to remember that back then the rab was not a social worker. Uh, the the role of the rab would be when they slaughter a chicken and there is a sheila a question. They would come to him. Maybe some of you still remember that that's what the rab used to do. And they would go to the rab with the Sheila, and uh, if there was a Sheila in Tarat HaMishpacha, if there was a I mean, this type of questions, they would come to him, and he didn't have to give drash or sermons. Who's who heard about it? So he would not give, that's that's in Western Europe. These are the advanced uh, cultural people. In Eastern Europe, you would give two drashot a year. One was in Shabbat Agadol before Pesach, the other would be before Rosh Hashanah, before Yom Kippur, on Shabbat Shuvah, and the whole mark of this drashot was that no one would understand what the rab would say. To pill pull from one subject, not, not all the rabbanim were like that, but our hero was like that. Okay, uh, but that's what he what he liked. He didn't want to speak about tshuva. He spoke. I am exaggerating. Okay, I apologize because I, I shouldn't do that. But I'm trying to give you in a, in a few short sentences. So I'm a little uh, overdoing it. He did wrote a, a letter about Tshuva, so it, it's not that Chazchel was completely disconnected from, from Shava points. But uh, but he, I, I'm trying to give the message. He was responsible for Halacha. If you have other problems, go to, to other people. He is responsible for Halacha, and that means that most of the time, what does he do? Sit and learn. And that's what he liked. I mean, he was perfectly fine with that. 
There was only one problem. It was a very small a Jewish populated city and they have no money. Everyone was poor. That was me again. In Jewish, uh, uh, Russian in that time, there were, you have a few very, very, very rich people, which usually didn't live in the Staters. They lived in uh, in St. Petersburg. They lived in the places where they, were, they bought the privilege to live in Russia proper and do business there. But the Staters, everyone was starving. The Raf was starving, the Khazan was starving, the, the Gabai was eh, starving. The poor people were starving and the people that donated them the money were starving. Everyone was starving. Just read the Chuvot or read the literature. That was, again, I'm exaggerating, but not too much. Because the Russian Empire took this part of Poland that was so successful and thriving and, and make it into a, a night, a, a helmer. Night, nightmare, nightmare, thank you. A hellish nightmare, that's what I meant. A, a hellish nightmare. That's what they did. Because they they choked trade. They didn't allow you to trade anymore. They put all of these heavy taxes. So it's it, it destroyed everything. And they didn't care because they didn't care. Again, that's the type of people they were. That's why there was a revolution. Because they didn't care. And uh, and that's the situation. So he lives there for two years, and then he he understands that he, he, you have to get a salary. You cannot live from thin air. Even if you can live from thin air, your wife cannot live from thin air. So he had to live. He's living to a, a, a slightly larger city named Braza. Nowadays it's called Braza Kartoska. I don't think that you have anything to, to look for there. So it's again, it's a small place with a few Jews, but they were allowed, uh, 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 they were able at least to pay him some very humble salary. So he lived there. Uh, and then a few years later, he advances. Back then it was very common that you would not stay in one city, but you'd become a rabbi of a small place. And then if you are able, you would advance to a, a bigger city. So he went to a place named Nishviz. Uh, now then, he, he already became to be, become known. People became to come, they began to come to him uh, from other places. And that uh, got him into trouble with the government. Uh, because the government didn't want the rabbis to be paskening in monetary questions. Because if you have a monetary question, go to the Russian court. Why do you go to these rabbis? So rabbis were not allowed, even as private, how do you say, buririn, okay. arbitraries, even nothing. You are not allowed, if you have a beard, you are not allowed to give uh, money bullocks. Uh, but he gave, as every other rabbi gave. And as you can imagine, when one of the sides was not happy about the ruling that he gave, then what do you do? You go to the police and tell them that the rabbi is giving psika on, on, on Mamunot. So that was the end of that. And he had to run away from the city. But the lucky was that the Russian government was also so corrupt. They were, they were anti-Semitic. But they were also so corrupt that many times if you can just move from one city to the other, then there would be no communication and they wouldn't know that they are supposed to continue to persecute you. That's just bribe someone and everything would, would go on. So uh, in 1851, uh, he's moving to Novardok. Now, Novardok was a city. Jewishly, I mean, that was a big Jewish city, and he got this position because already his name was now known, well known in uh, in Eastern Europe as a great rabbi in Posek, and uh, and he be, he he became they called him Rosh Kabahag, that means uh, Rosh Kol Bnei Agola, the head of all of the diaspora Jews. Now one has to admit that he is extremely Litvish centrist, meaning that you can say that he is the head of all of the diaspora Jews, if you believe the diaspora Jews live from, uh, I don't know, from Hungary uh, to, to Russia. If it's all of the Jews that you admit of, then yes, he is the Rashka Bag and he is the Posse Kador. But you know what? It is to this day. You would open a, 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 a Faredi newspaper and they would say about someone, he is the Posse Kador. Avel Yashiv, for example, as a concept of Archa, was the Posse Kador. Now, he was a very important Posse. But implying that his Posek Ador is just incorrect because the Sephardim had their own Posek and Hasidim had their own Poskim. I mean, he, he was Posek Hador. He was one of the Poskim in the generation. A very important one. I, I, I hope that it's completely understood. And not, <laughs> it is not of my place uh, to say anything to, to belittle him. 
רבי אליהו או רבי יצחק אלחנן נספח, just we have to understand that we many times, uh, I'm looking around, I guess that most of us are of some Ashkenazic heritage, and there is this, even in history books sometimes, they have this extremely Ashkenazi-centered, uh, centric view. So if someone is a great rabbi in the Ashkenazic world, then he is the Rash Kabahak, he is the head of the, um, this is Rash Kabahak. Uh, I mean, there are very important post in the Sephardic world. Uh, we spoke about some of them in the, that lived in parallel uh, to, to, to Rabbi Tzak HaKanan Spector. And with all due respect, they didn't, they had his shoot and they related to them, but they didn't accept his yoke as the, the Rash Kabahan. So just uh, that's a note I think that we have to, to carry in mind when you speak about, uh, about these great, great, great people. Uh, so, anyhow, uh, he's become, but he's the Rash Kabahag. After all, everything that they said, all the Russian Jews and Ukrainian Jews and Polish, everyone that was in this uh, orbit of Russia, Litvish Jews, saw him as the, the, the last Cossack. And everything that he said, more or less, was, as you know, Jews are Jews. So obviously, people would dispute, but uh, very authoritative. As authoritative as you can get by Jews. Uh, there he also printed his first sefer named Be'er Yitzchak, that Yitzchak's well, uh, and uh, that made him even more famous as Yitzhuvot uh, were uh, becoming more and more famous. Uh, before beginning to speak about his own activities, a little more background. In 1855, Tsar Nikolai was the, the uh, you would excuse me, but he was the Russia, right? The Russia meaning Russia, and Russia means real Russia. And that was the head of the persecutions against the Jews. So he died. Uh, no one in the Jewish community really uh, said Shiva for him. Uh, they had to take eulogies, because you had to take eulogies. Uh, so they gave eulogies in, in shul and in the in the city square. But under their breath, everyone said, Baruch Shabtar Anu Meonsho Shel Zeh. His son was Alexander II. Now, he was an enlightened... The, 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 uh, despot, an enlightened despot. Uh, so he he put, I, I spoke about the Russians going in these two arms that really were contradicting. That is, uh, trying to liberalize the Jews and also persecuting them. So when you try to liberal them, then you are trying them to get more uh, into the, uh, the, the Russian, more Russified. But when you persecute them, you galvanize them as one entity. So it, it really works uh, in, in contradiction. So he was putting more weight on the time to liberalize them. So there would be now reforms. I don't know if it was still allowed to use the word reform. Maybe you want revolution, but I don't know. But uh, so there will be reforms in the Hader system because as you said, the Hader system was broken. Now that was clear for everyone to see. The Melamdim were usually the most unsuccessful people in the Jewish community, they became the teachers of the young children. That, that is obviously a system that cannot work. It would produce, and, and then again, there are many, many stories. It was extremely rough, extremely, um, not violent, how do you say, uh, uh, aggressive, uh, makot. Uh, so they would, uh, they would. Uh, Strict, maybe? Yeah, very strict, but but uh, also they, they very very physically they, they were punishing physically. Hmm? Yeah, corporal yeah. well, punishment, but there is a word. Uh, anyhow, uh, it will come later to me. Uh, so they would. Uh, so it was it was very very difficult, and and again, as I said, it worked for a very few children, but for most of them, uh, it didn't work. Now everyone knew that, but the problem was how do you fix it without the government creeping in? and really taking control of the whole system. So the Orthodox found themselves protecting a system that they knew is, is problematic, but they, helped, they had to protect it because the other solution was to completely give it to the Russians to decide how it would look like, and the Maskilim were always putting their hands into it, and it was a very difficult situation. So Alexander II, uh, was uh, giving very strong powers to this maskilim, this enlightened Jews. Now, there are different types of maskilim. There were maskilim that were religious, but they just wanted minor reforms. 
And there were other Moschini that were completely vehemently uh, uh, opposed to religion and new newspaper, Jewish newspapers are being established, of course, with the support of the government in which the Rabbanim were being you know, decimated. And uh, a few Moschini, their names, now they, nowadays their names are obscure, but their names of days past as Avra, Mafu, and Yalag, and Gordon, it is Gordon, uh, and others that were writing uh, very, very strongly, uh, bitterly against the rabbis and how corrupt they are, and they steal the money of the poor, and they give this sequel that are against the Jews, and they just want to be strict, and they don't care about... Now, when I said that there was not, never any rabbi that was corrupt, I'm sure that there were. But it, I mean, this was really outlandish accusations against people that no rabbi was making money. Okay, that, that was not what they were doing there. And it was uh, it was destroying the leadership of the Jewish people because when that's what is written in the newspapers again and again and again and again. So this was, was the message we're getting. And everything was, was extremely shaky as it was because as I said, it was the, the Cantonist uh, decree that created distrust, disbelief in the leadership because the leadership were not able to lead. Because how can you lead? You lead. What, what would you say? I'm giving my own children as the rabbi. What would you say? I, I mean, I'm, I'm leaving the question with you because I have no answer. You do what? A lottery system? But is a lottery system fair? Because a lottery system, if someone, a family has only one child, another family has five children. Is it fair? A lottery system? Uh, now, I'm not, uh, you can say every child is a war to himself, and I, I would completely agree. But on the other hand, you can also understand the difference between taking an only child and taking one of a five. Now, these are decisions that most of the rabbis were not able to handle. How would they handle it? So that created, as I said, the disbelief as it was in the rabbinic elite. And when you add to that these unceasing attacks from the Maskilim that were supported by the Russian government, so things were going down the tubes. And that's, uh, and that's happening from 19, 1855 to 80, 1881. Because in 1881, Alexander II is being murdered by the socialists, by the revolutionists, which are beginning to raise their head. Now, as you may know, the percentage of the Jews among the, the socialists was very high for understandable reasons, because they had high stakes in changing the, the regime, and because they had these new ideas, and because they were always about... Now, Jews were not part of the team that murdered Alexander II, but it was the easiest for the Russian regime to deflect the hatred and the fear of the masses against the Jews. But we would, we would come to that before 1881. Uh, so right now, Rabbi Yitzhak is in, uh, in Novardok, and then in 1864, he moves to Kovna, which is uh, the biggest city back then in Lithuania. It's not Lithuania. It's, uh, I think nowadays it's Lithuania. I, I, I do not follow. The, as I said, things are changing there all the time. Uh, nowadays, where it is? Lithuania. In Lithuania. So, yeah. Yeah, but as I said, back then it, it didn't really matter because everything was Russia. It was the pale, as they call it, the pale settlement, meaning the, the place where Jews were allowed to live. Uh, but Kovna was a, the biggest city, and when he became the rabbi, it became the most important Jewish city, the center of all the shalot. Everything would come to him. He was, even by the government, he was seen as the authority that represents uh, the Yehudim, the Orthodox Jews. That is, although he could not get a formal uh, appointment. Why? Because in Russia, that was part of the Takanot by the Russian government, if you wanted to be a formal rabbi, you had to have a degree. Either that you learn in a rabbinical seminary of the Russians, in which you can guess what was being learned. Uh, it was not Gemara. Or either... You could be a, a traditional rabbi, but you had to take an exam in Russian and in elementary math. I don't know what was in the 
in the exam, and and ninety nine percent of Jewish rabbis, of Orthodox rabbis, were, were just, they, they would not be able to pass the exam, and they were not interested in passing the exam because it was part of defending Orthodoxy, defending Judaism that. An Orthodox traditional rabbi is an Orthodox traditional rabbi. He doesn't speak Russian. You take it as a badge of honor that you do not speak proper Russian. So what happened, what was developing was this dual system. I think we spoke about it at least once. You had the rabbi, the crown rabbi. They called it the Rav Mitam. Mitam means a, a, a bai. So the, the Rav by the Russian government. And you had the Rav Ruhani. That is the spiritual rabbi. That was the real rabbi. And the Rav Mitam would have this Russian uh, papers, the Gri, uh, and he would be responsible for writing the marriages and writing who died and giving reports to the Russian crown. And the real rabbi was the real rabbi, meaning he would sit and learn and give a chuvot. So that was the system. Rabbi Tzrek and Hanan did his best to undo it. Uh, and as, a, as I b- began to speak about, he was... Respect, excuse me, respected even by the Russian government because the, no one knows how he did it. Because I said he was not a man of speeches, very far from it. It was well known that he is a. I, again, I apologize. I have I'm not saying anything that is belittling, but it was known that he was not a big darshan. But he's. They, I can only quote what they say in the you know in the in the text. And the people that wrote about him, they say that his face radiated kindness and and goodness, and uh, and and everyone just was. Con- I mean, he had this special personal charisma that was able to conquer everyone, be it uh, uh, the Orthodox, which obviously loved him, but also the Fry, right, the 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 more liberal circles, the Maskilim. Everyone respected Rabbi Yitzchak and Hanan. He's the last of this type in Russia, that everyone respected. After him, the war was so strong between the, the in Israel, in the Jewish people, right, that, uh, that the Moskilim did not respect anyone after him. He was the last one that was respected by by virtually everyone. You can think about Rav Kook here, for example, <laughs> as, a, as an example. Uh, so this type of a towering figure. And even the Russian respected him. Uh, so he had uh, he had moves in the in the corridors of the government, and he was able to pull off some things. So, for example, he was able to put in hold the reform in the in the education system in the Hadarim. Uh, they say there is a story I I cannot attest to it, but they say that once he had to go into the minister of education to speak about one of the reforms, and he needed a translator because he couldn't speak proper Russian. So they gave him a maskil that was able to speak proper Russian. And the maskil was very dubious about this man who's very rabbinic in looking. And what can he say to the government, to the, to the, to the minister of education? Was a, you know, a Russian, a, a very educated literature, Russian. So what can he say to him? He was strong. He went in. And the rabbi told him, Rabbi Hanan told him, you must repeat time every word that I say. And he warned him. Know that I cannot speak Russian, but I hear Russian. Don't change a word. Okay. They go into the meeting, and the rabbi says to the minister, I wanted to give you regards from your uncle in Constantinople, in uh, Istanbul, you'd say today. And the the minister said, thank you. And the translator, the translator, the minister said, thank you. And then the rabbi said, shalom, goodbye, and went out. Now, the translator said to himself, I knew that this rabbi know nothing. I just gave a regard. What the translator didn't understand is that the rabbi understand much more than he. What happened was that they bribed the minister. Now, you couldn't pay directly to him. So they arranged that the payment would go through the uncle in Istanbul. And that's everything that the rabbi said, that you have a regard, meaning the money went. To the uncle in Istanbul, that was everything that was needed, and the reform was cancelled. So that's the way that's the way things were conducted. Obviously, nowadays we would see that it's a very negative eye if a rabbi was to bribe a minister in the government. But back then, I mean you have to 
אם נפלת התנבל, right? When, when you deal with the wicked, you, you play with their own uh, weapons. You cannot, uh, you cannot play nicely when you have against you someone like the Tsar. So that's, uh, uh, that's an interesting story that tells us something about his ability. So it, again, it's, it's a combination. He was always deep into learning. They say that he was a multitasker. that he would speak with someone, but always in the back of his mind, there would be like a, a process running, answering true vote and things that he was asked. And sometimes in the middle of it, he would speak with someone very attentive and say, please excuse me for a minute. And you'd write something down. Or you, you would go to a safer, look at it, which has nothing to do with the, the season now, with the discussion now, but because as I said, there was multitasking in his back of his mind all the time. So on one hand, he was a man of Gemara, very... narrow in that sense and on the other hand he was the man of the big world and he was able to be to get friendly with everyone as I said even with the mastilim and that helped him because uh, because it helped to be honest it only delayed because the culture camp the the, the war would would be conducted be waged and if I may say the Orthodox would I don't want to say lose but would suffer heavy heavy cause of this. In Eastern Europe uh, from the Enlightenment. But as long as he lived, he defended the generation. He, he shielded them. He was able to delay this uh, uh, movement to the left. I apologize again for using these terms, but this movement to the religious left. Uh, okay, now one of the ways by which he was able to do so was, and that's very interesting, He had Meshamshim, right? He had his uh, personal helpers. And I think it's a, it's a genius. Uh, so he was like playing, uh, this is my interpretation, but I'm, if I may say, I'm sure that's what happened. He was playing like the good cup and the bad cup. So he was always the good cup. But he has his, his personal helpers that they, when he needed to say something sharp, Or really to act against someone he would give one of his helpers to do the work and then they would blame them for they would say you know Rabbi Khanan is so nice and these helpers they are taking him in, in wrong directions and they are bad and evil so for example he was a member of the Haskala society that's amazing he was a member of the Mafitsi Haskala that was the, the name Uh, in uh, in uh, in Russia that was led by Baron Ginsburg who was a very rich person living in St. Petersburg and he was a, they were personal friends now this Baron Ginsburg was he was religious we may say but he was extremely 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 liberal and masculine and uh, he was always supporting the masculine so he asked once Rabbi Tzvay Khanan why won't you join our nice society of masculine and I said you know what that's an excellent idea Because I believe that Ascala should not contradict Torah. And he went into society. Now, obviously, that Ascala was contradicting Torah. There is no question about it. But it was important for him to be part of it. Now, so he was the head, or, or a, like an honorary head of the Ascala society. And he had a helper, a secretary named uh, Yaakov, uh, excuse me, Yaakov Lifshitz, who later wrote a whole memoir about his life with Rabbi Tzrak and Hanan, uh, and, uh, and his, his secretary was extremely anti-masculine. So his secretary would write a sharp critics against the masculine in the name of Rabbi Tzrak and Hanan. And Rabbi Tzrak and Hanan would visit, he got everyone confused, and he was able to play and to walk between, uh, to walk between the, the, how do you say, the teapot, right? the, the, the raindrops, to walk between and, and not get wet. So, attack what he needed to attack, but defend what he needed to defend. And it's amazing. And remain friendly with everyone. Uh, <laughs> he was against the Musa movement, but his best friend was Rabbi Israel Salanter and his Talmud Rabbi Tzak Blaser. Now, how can you take it in both hands? Rabbi Tzak and Hanan could. That was so special about him. He was just... And again, it's a personal thing. No question. It was a personal thing. Just this ability... To become friend of everyone but not lose his uh his uh, spine cord can you say that right it, to remain 
היא איזה עמוד שדרה. היא never budged from what he believed in, but he was able to say everything with such a smile that people were willing to eat it, right? And again, if there was a need for a harsh move, he would do it by the secretary. And it worked. It worked throughout all of his life. It's amazing. Now, our time is short. His public activity is endless. You can speak about him. Mark Shapiro, maybe some of you know, Professor Mark Shapiro from YU. So we have seven lectures, uh, each one more than an hour, about Rabbi Yitzhak el uh, So even if you play it at, uh, at uh, two, right, uh, double, double, double speed, <laughs> it's, it's very... So, so there is much, much, much to speak. There is no way that we can cover even a, a little. Uh, so I'll just mention a few very interesting incidents. So one is, he established the Kovna Koilin. Now, that's a new thing. There was no such a thing as a Koilin. Um, but he saw that the yeshivot, the yeshiva is Volozhin, that produces Talmidei Chachamim, but they were not able to become poskim, because in Volozhin you learn Gemara for the sake of, the sake of Gemara, just in our yeshivot nowadays. You are not able to pasken, because you didn't learn Shulchan Aruch. How can you pasken? You didn't learn the sponsor. How can you pasken? So he created this Kolel in Kovna, he was able to collect money from all over Europe, and he created the established scholar in which uh, people would sit and learn, and it was dedicated to become a rav of a kehila, of a city, and, and become a posek. Many very important poskim came out of this scholar, many. No less important. Now, this scholar led all the time that it operated, and it operated up till the revolution, and after the revolution, up to the second World War. There were financial problems. Now, what, does it, what do I mean? There was enough money, but money was always disappearing. And people become very, very worried, and even more than worried, about it. There was slender, that, not that the Rebbe is stealing money. As I said, no one, he was a saint. No one thought that he is stealing something. But the Rebbe Blazer was the head of the coil and was blamed by the Maskilim as stealing money from the coil because the, the sheets did not add up. Now we know, many, many years later, they were financing illegal yeshivot all over Russia. So they collected money for this kolel. They collected 20 times what they needed for the kolel. And they were delivering the money to all of these illegal yeshivot that the, the Russian government did not allow to, to establish. So you couldn't put out a, a, a normal account of where the money is going to. Uh, and he took it all on his shoulders, he and, and Rebizak Blazer, and they were they were blamed for, as I said, for stealing, and, and, and that he doesn't know what is going around him. Uh, but uh, but all the time the money was given to these illegal issues. Again, it's, I think it's uh, extremely interesting. Uh, another thing, uh, in times of hunger, as I said, times of hunger were not rare in Russia. He allowed the eating of kitniot. That was in... Uh, it's in the sources here, but we don't have time. It's, it was in 1869. Now, it was so famous that I heard it. My father, Zichon Olivrucha, heard it from his father. And I, I mean, that was a story that was told, I mean, that I remember being told as a young child, that in the time of famine, of hunger in uh, Russia, the great Rabbi Yitzhak Elchanan allowed the eating of kidneyot. Now, later... In the 50s, here in Israel, there was a time of big hunger in the Shnot Atsena, and they also, one year, the Beidin allowed Kitniot because of they relied on the precedent by Rabbi Yitzhak el So that's the, the scope uh, of his uh, authority, I mean, to allow Kitniot to Ashkenazim. I mean, if I would say they would stone me. Uh, so that's, uh, I mean, you know what? I take it back. Nowadays, it seems that uh, the Ashkenazim changed their taste. But back then, it was considered extremely, extremely sharp. The story goes, that's again the story from the secretary. He says that uh, a few rabbis came to him and they said, you cannot do it. It's against the minhag. And, and the reform would celebrate that it would be a feast for them. Because uh, here they would say, you see, the rabbis also uh, admit that you can change, uh, you can change minhagim. He told them, it's easy for you to speak. I carry on my shoulders all of these poor people that have nothing to eat. And the price of wheat was the roof. 
So they cannot buy matzah. They can only buy kidneyot. If you'd come in, that's what he said to them. If you'd have come in here with money to give them, I would hear to you. But if you are just coming to tell me that I am not able to let them eat, then I, I have nothing to do with you. And he said to them, not only that I would allow it, you would eat kidneyot as well. So no one would feel ashamed that he needs to eat kidneyot. And the story goes that they begged him <laughs> to release them of, of this decree. But he said, no, that's what you should do. And that's the story. That's how the story goes. And they I mean they accepted because again, he was the last authority, he was the final authority. Uh, so that's a, I think an amazing, an amazing story, which shows you his uh, the way that he, he appreciated his responsibility towards the, the general public. Uh Etrogim used to come from Kreitim. How do you say Krit? Krit from a place called Korfu. An island named Corfu. So it was very famous, the Etrogim of Corfu, and everyone bought from them in Europe, which was considered the AA Etrogim. And then the traders of Corfu understood, the Jews and the non Jews understood that they have a gold mine in their hand because all of European Jewry is dependent upon them. So what can you do? Like prices, why, why not? Why not? And he, when he understood what is going on, he declared a ban. On the etrogim of Corfu, he said you can buy from everywhere else, but you are not allowed to buy etrogim from Corfu. And he, he basically this almost destroyed them. Uh, but, I mean, as there were some Hasidic sects that uh, did not accept the decree, because if their rebbe fifty years ago bought an etrog from Corfu, that you know, then that's it. That's they they must have an etrog from Corfu. So it was not completely uh, held, but by most of the Jews it was held. Later, the Jews in Eretz Israel began to go at Rogim. So he continued the ban in order to support the new colonies in Eretz Israel, which would speak about his activities for the settlement of Eretz Israel in a few minutes. Uh, as I said, he was very active with the government, trying to pull off the crease to uh, help the Jews. Sometimes it helped, sometimes it failed, but he was doing his, his best there. Comes 1881. As I said earlier, Alexander II is leaving the scene with, uh, I mean, it's a very bloody scene. Uh, if you want to read history books, uh, then uh, go ahead. Uh, there is a bomb involved. Uh, and he leaves this world. Uh, I, I think he doesn't leave it better than what he was when he came in. <laughs> it's, uh, I mean, and you know how the Tsarist ended, right? So that's a, that's a type of people. Uh, so he's being murdered. And uh, then comes to the throne, the third Alexander. Now he's a reactionary. Because the second Alexander was considered as the liberal. And see how it failed. He was a liberal. And what did it cause? An uprise. So what does it mean? What do you need to do? Double down. Of course. Well, we know that it didn't work, right? But that's what he did. So all the old decrees came back. And it became really, really, really horrible. And as I said, there were pogroms. Now, the pogroms were arranged by the government. They didn't say it out aloud. But the pogroms were arranged by the government in order, as I said, to deflect the pain and the anger and the fear of the people against the Jews. That's what it was. And we know now, but not only now, uh, 70 years ago already, uh, that the, the Russian uh, government was moving Russians going. They were giving them free rides on the trains in order, I mean, they would say there would be a pogrom. In a certain place, they would tell the chief police, do not intervene for 24 hours, and they just let the dogs out. And uh, and it, you can only imagine. People were murdered and, and raped. It was, uh, it, was, uh, it, was, uh, it was horrible. It was just horrible. And the Jews had no, nothing to, to defend themselves. Nothing to defend themselves. That was called Sufot Banegev, Desert Storms. And that was what uh, initiated the great wave of immigration to the U.S. Some of you that are Olim from the U.S., I would guess that their parents came in that great wave of immigration in the end of the 19th century, in 1881, 1882. But in the end, the Americans themselves decided that they are shutting off the doors because we, we want all the poor of the world, but... On the second thought, we don't want them. So that's a, I mean, that's a, that's another talk. So, but millions of Jews, millions, 
uh, were beginning to, to travel all over the world, trying to find place because you couldn't stay in, 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 in Russia. It became a hell. It was a hell before, but it became a raging hell. And very few went to, very, very few went to Eretz Israel uh, when what was called later the second Aliyah. And most of them went to, uh, went to, to the U.S. The, the majority went to the U.S. Baron uh, Ginsburg, which I mentioned earlier, created colonies in Argentina, in Argentina, Argentina, Argentina and uh, for Jews. A very interesting experience uh, that he made there. Uh, which in the end it failed, being, again, looking uh, to history lenses, but it, he did the best that he could. That was also, and uh, it was helped, it was facilitated by Rabbi Tzakel Hanna, because in the beginning, the Baron Ginsburg wanted to invest all of the money in reforming the Jews in Russia, because if we reform them, then the Goim would stop persecuting them, which was complete uh, alienation. That's a yeah, completely. Uh, it was a dream, a pipe dream. Uh, but uh, so, but Rebita Gran was, was was able to 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 explain it to him, and then the money went to to create these colonies in Argentine. And uh, it's Hagel Hanan with letters from to Baron Ginsburg, uh, uh, trying to pursue him to to get rabbis there and and Shita and Mitzvah and Chadarim because people came there, but no Jewish life. Uh, so that was also part of what he was trying to do. Now, the Russian government was denying their involvement in the pogrom. They said, no, it's the Russian people just rising up against the Jews that are uh, uh, using them and abusing them because the Jews are the source of the troubles. Now, we, Chas Khalila, we are the Russian government. We do not do anything against the Jews. But it's only normal to expect that, uh, <laughs> that the peasants would uprise against the Jews. Now, Rabbi Yitzhak El Hanan decided they need to write letters to Jews all over the world in order to try to create pressure on the Russian government from people like Rothschild, Montefiore, you had uh, important people. Uh, but he knew that if his letters would be caught by the Russian government, the Jews would suffer even more. So they were able to conceal these letters as halachic tshuvot. A uh, very, very interesting story. So the, the, the letters were written in a in very Lachic style Hebrew and sent, and they were able to, to break through. And really, it, it, was, it was published in the London Times, which make a big splash all over the world. And then there was public pressure on the Russian government, which yielded a little, yielded a little. And I mean, nothing could be done. Well, we know that today nothing could be done. Now, there is a, a heartbreaking letter that he wrote as part of these letters. Uh, it's in source Dalit here. Uh, I would only read the first sentence. Sof davar, he says. I mean, that's in the, in the, in the end of the letter. Be'erech shisha million b'nei Yisrael yoshvim arzeinu tov'im be'yam tzara nora'a asher lo ha'yta kamor be'arzeinu. So there are six million people. So that was his estimation. Obviously, he didn't have a, a poll, but he estimated six million Jews in uh, Russia that were tovim uh, beyam tsara noraa. They are drowning in the trouble in the sea of a horrible trouble that had never been like that. Now we know that this. So this number gave me uh, shivers. Uh, six million, because there there, there were there would be more terrible troubles coming up ahead. And the anti-Semitism in Europe, not only in Eastern Europe, in Western Europe as well, they didn't know even. It's, a, it's amazing to think about that for me. I, mean, I'm, I, I know that I, I digress a little, but I digress a little, but they were sitting on a barrel of a explosive barrel on a bomb. And I mean, they knew much more about the going there than I am. But obviously, I, I, I was born here. What do I know about yeah, they go even in Europe in the 19th century, but I just have the benefit of history. And they were sitting on a time bomb. Everyone around them hated them to, to, to a point of murder. Not just hated, not just disliking the Jews. We know. We know what is what is ahead. We know what is ahead. But it's amazing. It's amazing. But he he was trying to do his best as everyone else. 
I, let's continue. Let's continue. Uh, so he began to support, as I said, the immigration to uh, Argentina. Now, again, he did it very quietly because you couldn't vocally support the immigration because then the Jews would be blamed for being disloyal. This is just, this is crazy anti-Semitism. You persecute the Jews. You murder them. You want them out. But then when they leave, you say that they, the Jews are disloyal to the Russian Empire. Of course they are disloyal to the Jew Russian Empire. But, but that is the crazy life that our forefathers had. You couldn't win. You just, whatever you do, whatever you do, you would uh, be mit bolel, right? Uh, uh, no? Intermarry. So the Jews are mixing their blood into the pure Russian race. You would be uh, separating yourself. The Jews think that they're better than everyone else and they're separating. You would work as a farmer. They are stealing our lands. You would work as a banker. They are taking... A repeat, right? Usually, uh, you think you do. You'd work as a newsletter. Pay. They are uh, running the media. There is nothing you can do that would make things straight. Nothing. That's the world that they inhabited, and I, I, they themselves, I think, they were so used to and they lived under it. I, they didn't understand even, as I said, the the type of of time bomb they are sitting on. Uh, so. As I said, the only solution is immigration. They didn't understand to what degree I mean, the people that immigrated saved their lives and the lives of their children. Uh, of course. Uh, so the only solution was immigration, either to, as I said, to South America or to Israel. So he became a member of Chovevei Zion, which again, it was a quasi-religious, quasi masculine movement, very, very complicated. Uh, he became a member and supported it wholeheartedly. He was the architect of the Hater Mechira in the in one of the first Shemitah years in Eretz Israel. So he allowed the selling of the land in order for the farmers to continue work the land because the understanding was that if they would not continue to work the land, then the, the Jewish settlement, the, the, which were very young, would not be able to to to, stone, to stand to hold. Uh, so that was and he was attacked for it by the more a radical, we may say, Rabbanim, but uh, but he didn't budge. He didn't budge because he believed that that is almost pikuach nefesh. Yeah, I mean, I, who am I to say who was right? But that's for sure. Every Jew that made Aliyah in the 19th century from Russia, he, in to the short term, it was a very difficult. But in the long term, it was one of the best deals that you could have done in uh, in that time. Wow, our time is up, and I was not able to read even one tshuva of his, and I uh, we didn't have the time to go into the heterim, the permits that he gave to the agunot. Uh, so, you know, okay. Uh, but as it is, I hope that we got at least a glimpse of the great man that uh, of Rubitz Raghachan Spector was. And uh, we should, we may we merit, uh, you know, to internalize at least some uh, of uh, of his qualities. Thank you. Uh, but it's not very, I don't know. Okay. Maybe I, uh, I don't promise. Maybe maybe we'll begin Shabu by a few words. Okay, thank you. <laughs> wow. Uh, I'm just reading now uh, something that Anne Kravitz wrote. She says, My great grandfather was a Cantonese soldier for 25 years and stayed Jewish. Yes. Yes, well, these were these type of people. So it's a uh, wow. Thank you for sharing it. It's a, uh, it's very uh, wow. Yeah, it's very inspiring and very moving. Thank you. Okay, Shavuot of.